Welcome to the Renaissance Period. The term Renaissance designates the rebirth of the arts and sciences that accompanied the complex and often painful economic, social, political, and intellectual transformations that took place in Europe between about 1300 and 1650. Francis Bacon, England's premier philosopher of science and Lord High Chancellor, said that if we considered the force, effects, and consequences of all the products of human ingenuity, the three most important inventions were printing, gunpowder, and the compass. The establishment of printing presses throughout Europe in the 1460s launched a communications revolution that might at least in part account for the permanence of the Renaissance. Gunpowder weapons have an important place in the history of medicine because they forced surgeons to deal with problems in multi-pocuses and gallons. As Europeans followed the compass around the world, they brought back new plants, animals, and remedies, and left them to wake a series of ecological and demographic catastrophes that transformed the world. For instance, with the new age of exploration of the world, the world, the mind, and the human body. The Renaissance era may have ultimately transformed European culture in a profound, permanent way that led to the modern world, but it was also a period in which mysticism, intolerance, and epidemic disease flourished. The death rate circa 1500 was about three times the present level, and life expectancy was perhaps half that of modern Europe. War, famine, and epidemic disease appeared so often that fears of the imminent end of the world were widespread. As an era of scientific and philosophical interest, if not therapeutic advances, the Renaissance is a time of special importance for medicine. Harry! Hey, Ron. Hey, guys. Hermione. What do you guys do over the weekend? I've learned a new magic. One that makes butterflies. That's so kindergarten. No, no. Watch this. Anulus ovalis. <coughs> <coughs> What's wrong? I got this. <laughs> Look who's here. Harry Potter and his stupid friends, especially. Weasley. I wonder how he got admitted here at Hogwarts School of Medicine. Special with his pea brain. <laughs> Don't mind him, Ron. Leave us alone, Draco. Draco's such a pain in the ass. By the way, Ronald, it's not annulus ovalis. It's annulus ovalis. Let me show you. Annulus ovalis. Fossa ovalis. Wow! That's cool, Harry. It's almost eight. Let's go. Has any of you read about our lesson for today, the arts and science of medicine subject? You're such a nerd, Hermione. Whoever studies for ASM, get a life. What about it, Hermione? Oh, Mr. Ronald Genius Weasley, let's see if we can answer later to Professor Snell if he calls you. He called me last time. He won't call me again. What makes you so sure? I bet he will. He won't. Will do. Will not. Will do. Will not. Why well, I mean I think he does. Deal. Let's start.
I assume all of you have read our topic for today, which is what, Harry Potter? It's about the Renaissance period, Professor. What's significant about the Renaissance period? Well, it was generally a period of scientific revolution which greatly influenced medicine in particular. Very well. What is the time period of the Renaissance? Ronald Weasley What is that, Weasley? I heard you say something. I was saying... Lucky. Lucky me called me. <laughs> I guess you know the answer then. Uh, 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 from 1300 to this high? That's the first correct answer you have made ever since, Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> but that was rather an easy question. I'll call you again later. Open your books to page 203. <laughs> Let's begin our discussion with the state of autopsies, art, and anatomy during the Renaissance. Autopsies, Art and Anatomy Interest in dissection and vivisection increased slowly between the 12th and the 17th centuries, but medieval autopsies were normally conducted to investigate suspicious deaths or outbreaks of plague, or even the search for special signs inside the bodies of perverted saints. Anatomical demonstrations throughout Europe varied considerably, but a typical public anatomy featured the corpse of a criminal guilty of a crime heinous enough to merit the sentence of execution and dissection. By about 1400, human dissection was part of the curriculum of most medical schools. The medical curriculum of the Renaissance University reflected a heavy commitment to the ancient authorities. For teachers as well as students, the purpose of dissection was to supplement the study of Gallic texts. One of the best known early dissection manuals was the anatomy of Mondino de Luzzi who served as public lecturer at the University of Bologna from 1314 to 1324. Mondino's anatomy was practical and succinct. The development of a special relationship with the sciences as well as the inspiration of classical Greek ideals gave Renaissance art much of its distinctive character. Artists played a new emphasis on accurately representing animals and plants scientific use of perspective and above all the idea that the human body was beautiful and worthy of study. Leonardo da Vinci While many Renaissance painters and sculptors turned to dissection, none exceeded Leonardo da Vinci, painter, architect, anatomist, engineer and inventor, in terms of artistic and scientific imagination. It was art that first led Leonardo to dissection, but he pursued anatomical studies of animals and humans with almost morbid fascination for nearly 50 years, dissecting pigs, oxen, horses, monkeys, insects, and so forth. Granted permission to study cadavers at a hospital in Florence, the artist spent many sleepless nights surrounded by corpses. His notebooks are full of brilliant projects, observations, and hypotheses about human beings, animals, light, mechanics, and more. But like so many of his projects, Leonardo's great book on the anatomy of natural man was left unfinished. His famous drawing, The Vitruvian Man, is based on the correlations of ideal human proportions, the geometry as described by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius. Leonardo da Vinci was convinced that all problems could be reduced to mechanics and mathematics. Da Vinci excelled at several fields in science, and the arts that he was referred to as the Renaissance Man. 
However, he was distrustful of medicine and denounced physicians as the destroyers of life, who lusted after wealth despite their inability to make an informed diagnosis. Andreas Vesalius Just as Copernicus and Galileo revolutionized ideas about the motions of the earth and the heavens, Andreas Vesalius, a physician, anatomist, and artist, transformed Western concepts of the structure of the human body. Vesalius' great treatise, The Fabric of the Human Body, appeared in 1543. The fabric of which is considered the first anatomical treatise based on direct observation of the human body is still regarded as a milestone in the history of anatomy. Vesalius was born into a world of physicians, pharmacists, and royal patronage. His father was imperial pharmacist to Charles V and often accompanied the emperor on his travels. As a youth, Vesalius began to teach himself anatomy by dissecting mice and other small animals. Although he studied at both the University of Paris and Louvain, institutions notable for their extreme conservatism, his innate curiosity was not destroyed by the benefits of higher education. As a medical student in Paris, Vesalius fought off savage dogs while collecting human bones from the Cemetery of the Innocents. In Louvain, he stole the remains of a rubber chain to the gallows and brought the bones back into the city hidden under his coat. He was awarded the MD in December 1537 and appointed lecturer demonstrator in, a in anatomy and surgery. Abandoning the traditional professional role, Vesalius lectured and dissected simultaneously. By 1538, Vesalius was beginning to recognize differences between Galenic anatomy and his own observations. In 1539, Marcantonio Contarini, a judge in Padua's criminal court, became so interested in Vesalius' work that he awarded the bodies, executed criminals, to the university and oblingingly set the time of execution to suit the anatomist's convenience. You could learn more at the butcher shop than at the lectures of blockhead professors who blindly believe all the theories of Galen and ignore the true workings of the human body. Human anatomy must be read from the book of the human body, not from the pages of Galen. The man made erroneous theories of the workings of the human body because he had never dissected the human body. Now is the time to acknowledge the truth from the fallacies which dominated the world since more than 10 centuries ago. Hostile reactions from outraged Galenists were inevitable. They regarded him as the Martin Luther of physique on the grounds that his hersies of medical innovations were as dangerous as Luther's effect on religion. Tired of the controversy, Vesalius became court physician to Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain, to whom he dedicated the Fabrica. Soon Vesalius discovered that imperial service was almost as unpleasant as a stormy academic world. In 1564, Vesalius went on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to extricate himself from the Emperor's service. Vesalius may have used the excuse of a pilgrimage to explore the possibility of returning to a professorship at Padua. Unfortunately, he died on the return voyage. Medicine and Surgery as a general rule, surgeons were expected to deal with the exterior of the body and physicians dealt with its interior. Surgeons dealt with wounds, fractures, dislocations, bladder stones, amputations, skin diseases, and syphilis. They performed bleedings under the direction of physicians, but were expected to defer to physicians in the prescription of post-operative care. Elite physicians could command a salary many times greater than that of surgeons. The status differential between physicians and surgeons is also apparent in the services they were willing to provide. For example, in a plague pest house, physicians remained outside and shouted advices to the surgeons who examined and treated patients. Despite such hazardous duty, surgeons were poorly paid. 
they were awarded just enough money to buy new clothing as a replacement of the clothes they had worn while in the pest house which they burned. In many areas, a license to practice medicine could be obtained on the basis of education or by an examination measuring practical skills. Examination measuring practical skills was especially important to women because they were denied access to a university degree. Most women practitioners seem to have been the widows of physicians or surgeons. They were occasionally recruited by the public health authorities to care for female patients quarantined in pest houses during plague outbreaks. Ambrose Paré Warfare provided golden opportunities for enterprising surgeons. The battlefield has always been known as the ultimate medical school. In such an environment, it was possible for Ambrose Paré, an illiterate French barber surgeon, to think his own thoughts, learn by experience, and bring pride and dignity to the art of surgery. Paré was a deeply religious man who acknowledged only one final authority. To Paré, surgery was a divine calling. Despite the lowly status of its practitioners, Paré's surgical texts provide vivid and moving accounts of the horrors of war, as well as accounts of the kinds of wounds caused by weapons unknown to Hippocrates and Galen. Oftentimes, after a battle, injured soldiers died from lack of food and attention, or from frugal measures used to treat them. When Paré began his career in military surgery, he followed John Vigo's method of deeply cauterizing gunpowder wounds with boiling oil. But when his supply of oil was exhausted, he was forced to treat the rest of his patients with a wound resin made of eggs, oil of roses, and turpentine. In comparing the outcome of these treatments, Paré discovered that the patients who had received a mild dressing healed better than those cauterized with boiling oil. To aid the healing of burned flesh, Paré recommended a dressing of raw onions and salt. In some cases, however, Paré recommended the use of his famous poppy oil balm. He had procured a secret recipe for poppy oil at a great trouble and expense, but he openly published it for the benefit of all surgeons and patients. To prepare poppy oil dressing, the surgeon began by cooking two newborn puppies in oil of lilies until the bones dissolved. The oil was mixed with turpentine and a pound of earthworms, and then cooked over a slow fire. Paré was convinced that poppy oil suit pain and promote healing. In 1561, Paré was kicked by his horse. Two bones in his left leg were broken and worst, the fractured bones broke through his flesh. Fearing amputation of his leg, he bandaged his wound, splintered his leg, and treated the wound with rose ointment until the abscess drained. Moreover, Paré proved the uselessness of bezoar stones as well as many other widely prescribed and fearfully expensive remedies and antidotes, such as unicorn horn and mummy powder. Noblemen drank from vessels made of unicorn horn and carried unicorn horn with them when traveling in order to ward off illness. But some physicians recommended mummy in the treatment of bruises and contusions because of its alleged power to prevent blood from coagulating in the body. Astrology and Alchemy The artistic and scientific triumphs of the Renaissance were not completely unstained by superstition and the occult sciences. Medicine, along with other arts and sciences, remained entangled with astrology, alchemy, and other varieties of mysticism. One form of prognosis, known as astrological medicine, was based on the assumption that the motions of the heavenly bodies influence human affairs and health. In practice, astrological medicine required knowing the exact time at which the patient became ill. In therapeutics, astrological considerations determined the nature and timing of treatments, the selection of drugs, and the use of charm. Doctor, I've been feeling unhappy lately for no reason at all. 
Let me see. Mm hmm. Huh? Hmm. I know this. Saturn did this to you. Saturn? The planet? Yes, Saturn. The dark and cold planet. Your condition is cold. Saturn, melancholia. What time of the day did you first have this headache? It was in the morning. Hmm. Then this headache is a chronic one because of the presence of the sun. Can you do something about it, doctor? We can actually do a bloodletting as this headache may be caused by excess of blood. But it must be conducted on a full moon to ensure a steady blood flow. On the other hand, alchemy, a broad discipline with the primary goal of transforming base metals into gold, also encompass the search for the elixirs of health, longevity, and immortality. Alchemists are praised as the pioneers of modern chemistry. One notable alchemist who pioneered the use of chemical drugs is Philippus Aureolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, who is also a physician and pharmacologist. He is famously known as Paracelsus. Paracelsus believed that disease was a result of derangements in the chemical functions of the body rather than a humoral equilibrium. He declared that all diseases could be cured by specific chemical substances. He believed that the only difference between a drug and a poison is their dose and that alchemy made it possible to separate out the curative virtues hidden within poisons. However, not all parasocial drugs were derivatives of toxic metals. His laudanum, a preparation based to induce restful sleep and ease pain, was essentially opium in wine. Prepare for a hundred item quiz tomorrow. Huh? What? what? Professor's not at such a bore. Come on, Ron. Let's take our snacks. Ronald, you owe me an ice cream. Huh. Sir Harper. Good morning. You may now take your seats. I believe Professor Snell has already discussed with you quite a lot. We have very interesting topics today. Kindly open your books to page 230. The 15th century was a time of great voyages, commercial expansion and warfare during which previously isolated peoples were suddenly immersed in a globalized germ pool. Many epidemic diseases flourished under these conditions, and one notable example of which is syphilis, a venereal disease. The term syphilis was first applied in 1530 by the Italian physician and poet Girolamo Fracastoro. The history of syphilis has been well studied, but the exact origin of syphilis is unknown. The Columbian hypothesis proposes that syphilis was carried to Europe from the Americas by Columbus and his crew. We have conquered the new world. Now men, let's go make ourselves merry tonight. Come here, you three ladies. One of the most famous Greek physicians believed that the circulatory system consists of two separate one-way systems of distribution, rather than a single unified system of circulation. Moreover, he believed that blood traversed from the right ventricle to the left ventricle through invisible pores. Gallant's theories remained uncontested for more than ten centuries, until after one of few brave souls dared to challenge his principles, 
with the risks of social rejection, one of whom is Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus, the first European physician to describe the pulmonary circulation, was a man who spent his whole life struggling against the dogmatism and tolerance that permeated the Renaissance world. In 1553, Servetus published a radical treatise entitled On the Restitution of Christianity, though it is clear that his inspiration and motives of writing restitution were primarily religious, it is in the 700-page treatise that he made an account of the pulmonary circulation. Disputing Galenic concepts that oxygenation of the blood was the function of the left ventricle of the heart, Servetus believed that changes in the color of the blood indicated that oxygenation took place in the lungs. However, both Catholics and Protestants found the work blasphemous, with the latter condemning him to burn at the stake without mercy. While in no way as colorful a figure as Servetus, Real de Colombo was a more influential scientist and teacher. Colombo, the son of an apothecary, was apprenticed to an eminent Venetian surgeon for seven years before he began his studies of medicine, surgery and anatomy at the University of Padua. Apparently, Colombo had no knowledge of Michael Servetus' work and made his own discovery of pulmonary circulation, which he demonstrated in his anatomical treatise, Triatatomica, published in 1559. Another notable figure celebrated as the discoverer of both the minor and major circulation by certain admirers is Andrea Cecil Pino. Cecil Pino, a professor of medicine and botany at the University of Pisa, was a learned man who combined a great reverence for Aristotle with an appreciation of Renaissance innovations. His descriptions of the valves of the heart, the blood vessels that link the heart and lungs, and the pathways of the pulmonary circulation were well defined. He spoke of the heart in very lyrical terms as the fountain from which four great blood vessels irrigated the body, like the four rivers that flow out from paradise. Girolamo Fabrici, a famous professor of anatomy at the University of Padua, made a great contribution on his study of the structure, distribution and function of the venous valves, which was later published in his work On the Valves of the Veins in 1603. But it was his student William Harvey, an English physician who was first to describe completely and in detail the systemic circulation and properties of blood being pumped to the brain and body by the heart. Following the footsteps of the great English humanist scholars, Harvey went to the University of Padua where he graduated as Doctor of Medicine. In 1602, Harvey returned to England to establish a successful medical practice. His marriage to Elizabeth Brown the daughter of Lancelot Brown, physician to Queen Elizabeth I and James I, gave him access to the highest court and professional circles. As one of the king's physicians, Harvey was charged with some peculiar assignments such as the diagnosis of witchcraft, an area of considerable interest to James I. His magnum opus, an anatomical treatise on the motion of the heart and blood in animals, usually referred to as the motu cordis, was published in 1628. It gave a perfectly clear and connected account of the action of the heart and the consequent movement of the blood around the body. The task of studying an active heart is truly arduous. I am almost tempted to think that the movement of the heart was only to be comprehended by God. Nevertheless, using arguments based on the section VV session and the works of Aristotle and Galen, Harvey was able to prove that in the adult, all the blood must go through the lungs to get from the right side to the left side of the heart. He proved that the heart is muscular and that its most important movement is contraction rather than dilation. But his most radical idea was that it was the beat of the heart that produced a continuous circular motion of the blood. Although the single lens microscope was already invented in 1590 by Zacharias Janssen, Harvey's work was performed without the aid of the microscope. And like almost all fundamental discoveries, Harvey's work provoked an avalanche of new questions and a storm of controversy, which is why he delayed the publication of his treatise, fearing he would have mankind at large for my enemies. During the English Civil War, Harvey attended to King Charles I in Oxford, but after the surrender at Oxford in 1645, with his wife already dead at that time, Harvey, at the age of 68, retired from public life and returned to London and lived there with his brothers until the day of his death. William, 
you still have a lot of unfinished manuscripts which I'm sure contains brilliant ideas. Have you no intention to finish them? <clears throat> you know full well what a storm my former work raised. Much better is it oftentimes to go wise at home and in private than by publishing what you have amassed with infinite labor to stir up tempests that may rub your peace and quiet for the rest of your days. However, one of the major gaps in Harvey's work was his inability to identify the structures joining the arterial and the venous system. It was Marcello Mopigi who completed the blood circulation by discovering the capillary network through the aid of a microscope. Well, I guess that ends it. Have you learned something today? Yes, Professor Harper. Very well then. Cheerio! I'm so hungry. Oh, I'll take so much. Good afternoon, afternoon, Professor Barron. Huh. Okay, sit down. Let's start. Open your books to page 234. While William Harvey's work opened up new fields of research and ignited violent controversies, it certainly did not threaten the livelihood of phlebotomists. Bloodletting and other forms of depletion therapy was still widely practiced during the Renaissance. Bleeding was recommended in the treatment of inflammation fever, plethora, and a multitude of disease states. Patients too weak for the lancet were candidates for modern methods such as cupping and leeching. No apothecary shop could be considered complete without a bowl of live leeches ready to do battle with afflictions as varied as epilepsy, hemorrhoids, obesity, tuberculosis, and headaches. Doctor, I have a very stubborn headache. These leeches will cure you. Stay still. Santoyo Santoyo was honored as the founder of quantitative experimental physiology in Italy. Santoyo established a successful private practice after graduating from the University of Padua in 1582. In addition to medical practice, Santoyo became intimately involved in research concerning a phenomenon known as insensible perspiration. According to classical theory, a kind of respiration taking place through the skin produced imperceptible exhalations known as insensible perspiration. Santorio believed that he could reduce the problem of insensible perspiration to purely mechanical processes that could be studied by exact measurements. In order to do so, he invented a special balance, a chair suspended from a steel yard in which he measured his body weight after eating, drinking, sleeping, resting and exercising in health and disease for more than 30 years. Santoyo published his results as a series of aphorisms in a small book entitled Ars de Statica Medicina. Insensible perception is what we now know as metabolism leading to carbon dioxide production. And we're done. I'll see you tomorrow. That's it? You can stay here if you want, but we're leaving. Come on, Harry. But wait, where are we going? To the forest. Mm, okay. Hmm. <laughs> it's really nice here. Wait, wait, where's Harry? 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 Harry! 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 Oh! 
Peekaboo! You gave you fright! Gotcha! Haha! <laughs> I'm looking for a Okay, flower. let's go. <gasps> Voldemort! The previous! Harry! Run! Let's see what's the door. What's that lovely piece you're playing, Minerva? It's a funeral song. Severus. <laughs> Sybil, what's wrong? It's like the Dark Lord. Where? In the forest. Harry Potter's in danger. I'm leaving. Minerva, let's go. You can hitch with me. Are you sure about this, Sybil? Don't worry, Minerva. I know what I'm doing. Please drive safely. Why are you here, Voldemort? Oh, the faculty of the School of Medicine brought it. School of Medicine, what kind of foolishness is this? Destroy the school! Fuck the doors! From the dark party! Your act is true! How? True magic is for the common good! Sister and Akaili! I'm just trying to say this! Excellent, sir. You resembled in your ASM finals exam. Thank you, sir. Ladies, you can come with me. Harry, I'm so glad you're fine. I guess I'll still live to be a doctor. Wait, where's Voldemort? Hmm? Hmm. Halloween. Look, <laughs>
One, three, go.